it's uh, it's great to be in at Seven Mountains. I love that name, uh, and we are we are about uh, you know reaching the world in in whatever area of influence God's given us. Yeah, and so I I, I love that love that name, and also uh, you know how many of you uh, how many of you desire to be a blessing to your pastors? You know, if you don't have a local church. Um, I mean, I'm not the super duper here today. It's the it's the people that are that put all of this on and that and that labor and that and that pray for you. And you know, when Jesus died and rose again, he gave gifts to men. Is that true? Okay. And one of those gifts are pastors. And uh, my wife and I pastored for 27 years. Why don't you stand up, honey? And we pastored for 27 years. And um, And you know we had we had all kinds of super dupers come to our church and and uh, and we had Andrew Womack and you know I mean we've had we had all kind we had all kinds of uh, Mario Murillo and all kinds of great people come through but but you know and then people would just you know uh, oh they'd just kind of do a rock star thing over them and kind of celebrity worship and. All that, but the real stars are the are the people doing the stuff at, in, in a local church. And so, uh, how many of you know that we are His sheep? Everybody say, "I'm a good sheep." I'm a good sheep. Everybody go, "Bah!" Yeah. Say, "I'm a good sheep." I'm not a goat. You know, you know what goats do, don't you? They butt. I love my pastor, but I love my husband, but I believe by His stripes I'm healed, but. Whatever's on the other end of your butt is what you really believe. And so be a, determined to be a blessing. Amen. Determined to be a blessing to your pastors. Lift their arms up. Find ways that you can help and serve. And, and you know, it's, there's opportunities back in the children's ministry. And, and uh, if you're a part of the church, just say, man, I, how can I help, pastor? Yeah? And and uh, just just be a, just determined to be a blessing, yeah. So uh, I've got a few uh, books left uh, back here, and so I'd love to resource this with you. This is a uh, this is my latest book called Flowing in the Supernatural, and you know the uh, I, I I was talking to uh, I was talking to Stan before uh, the service, you know when. When I was going, when I was part of a denominational church, I was reading the Book of Acts and then looking at the Gospels, and it, it didn't look the same, you know. And I, you'd see supernatural and signs and wonders and things happening, and so uh, this book is about how you and I can walk in the supernatural, how you and I can have signs and wonders in our lives today. We believe that. Jesus said if, if uh, in, in John 14, 12, if those of you that believe on me, the works that I do, you, you'll do also. How many of you know that 40 or 50% of Jesus' works were uh, signs and wonders? And so how do we operate in that and not be weird? Okay, not swing from chandeliers and stuff like that. You know, and but how, how, do, you, how do you have the... Uh, and, and how do you judge prophetic words? If people have a, a word for you, you've got, you're not obligated to act on that. You've got to check it out. And anyway, this is, this is a great book, and, um, and it uh, you know, tells you about the gifts, how you can operate in the gifts, how you can teach others to operate in the gifts. Do you have this, Stan? Yes, I do. Okay. Well, I'm going to give this to you, and you can just give it away to somebody, okay? All right. Okay, open your Bible. Wow. Okay, open your Bibles uh, wherever you'd like. <laughs> I'm going to be in uh, Jeremiah 29. I'm going to be in Jeremiah 29. I'm going to see if I can tighten this little dude. There we go. Okay. So, uh, Jeremiah 29, and before I get there, I want to have a funny, though, okay? This is called a hom homeless man's funeral. So as a bagpiper, I play many gigs. And recently, I was asked by a funeral director to play at a graveside service.
for a homeless man. He had no family or friends, so the service was to be at a pauper's cemetery in the Kentucky backwoods. As I was not familiar with the back, with the back country, I got lost. And being a typical man, I didn't stop and ask for directions. <laughs> I finally arrived an hour later and saw the funeral guy had, ev had uh, evidently gone and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only the grave diggers and the crew left and they were eating lunch. I felt badly and apologized to the men for being late. I went to the side of the grave and looked down and the vault lid was already in place. I didn't know what else to do, so I started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather around. I played out my heart and soul for this man with no family or friends. I played like I've never played before for this man, and I played as I played Amazing Grace. The workers began to weep. They wept, I wept, and we all wept together. When I finished, I packed up my bagpipes and started for my car. Though my head hung low, my heart was full. And as I opened the door to my car, I heard one of the workers say, I ain't never seen anything like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. Apparently, I'm still lost. <laughs> I guess it's a man thing. Praise God. That is funny. I don't care who you are. That's funny right there. <laughs> Jeremiah 29. A merry heart does good like a medicine. Yeah. Amen. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, and that word peace also means prosperity, and not of evil, to give you a future, everybody say a future, and a hope. And so, you know, I'm sure each of, each of us could, uh, you know, agree and, and recognize that 2020 was, was, a, was the pits, <laughs> right? I mean, with all the COVID-19 things and people lost their jobs and lost them loved ones and all the riots and the, you know, violence and the media bias and the election challenges and, and all, all the other stuff. I mean, the, the, a lot of confusion and distraction. And as we reflect back on, on last year and prepare to move into the new year, we can get stuck like Chuck looking in the rearview mirror. But God said here he's got a future and a hope for us. And it's not based on 2020 or COVID or anything else. It's based on his word. God's got a plan for you. He's got a future for you. And 2020 is not going to stop that unless you let it. Look at your neighbor say, I think he's talking to you. God's, God's got a, God's got a, your, your future's so bright, you, you have to squint to look at it. Are you hearing me? God's got a plan for you. He's not, he, he's not finished. I mean, the fact, guys, you know, we don't need to be wringing our hands in despair over, over what happened with an election or anything else. Do you understand if things had turned out different? that Jesus would not have automatically set up his millennial reign. Whether, you know, and our, and our Savior is not a political party. Right? It's not the publicans or the sinners. That's our, our Savior. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and so, listen, we need, we need to understand the church. We are the answer. We're the answer to this dark world. And God's got a future and a hope for you. And, and he's not done with you. Amen? And so your future consists of thoughts that you haven't thought yet. 
words you haven't spoken yet, actions you haven't taken yet, and circumstances that you don't know yet. And three out of four of those you can control. You can, you can control your, your thoughts, your words, and your actions. Yes? And, and you and I, God's got, a, God's got a plan for us, and He wants us to move into it. But it, do, it doesn't fall on you like ripe cherries off a tree. The will of God is not automatic. It's God's will that every person be saved. But is every person saved automatically? No, without, they have to believe. And, and in order to believe, they have to hear the Word of God. Yes? And so you and I have a ministry. You and I have a, have a, a sphere of influence that we're supposed to be making a difference in other people's lives. And you can't do that getting your focus on yourself and crying in your spiritual beer over things that have, have, didn't go right in the last year. Amen? Amen. You know, we, we, need to, we need to understand we've got a future and stop singing with Paul McCartney yesterday. All my troubles seem so far away. <coughs> or sing with Barbara Streisand the way we were. <coughs> No, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. God, we've got, God's got a future and a hope for you and me, and he wants us to come into it. How many of you are interested moving into your future? How many of you ever watched the movie Groundhog Day? Anybody ever watched that movie? Some of you, anybody didn't watch the movie? It's, you need to go and watch it. So it's, you know, it's an old movie. Uh, Bill Murray was a star, and he was a narcissistic, selfish, self-centered, you know, uh, television anchor or, you know, reporter. And he was out there at where, wherever that town was in Pennsylvania where they, uh, what's the name of that town that they do? Punxsutawney. Okay. Is that how you pronounce Punxsutawney? Whatever. And so that's, it's in Pennsylvania where they started the Groundhog Day. They were going to go out and see if the groundhog saw, saw his shadow on, what was it, February 1st? Is that when they do it? Anyway, so they, they, do, they do the story, and he's rude and, you know, everything to, the, to his team and other people. And, you know, and, and he's this selfish guy. He wakes up the next morning in the same day, and Sonny and Cher singing, I got you, babe. And he's, you know, he doesn't know what's going on. So then the next day he wakes up in the, in the same day. He wakes up every day in the same day. His first response was in shock. Next, in self-indulgence. He just ate everything he could, he could gather around and, and everything. And the next, in frustration, then depression, then giving up on life. And it's, he still woke up in the same day. The next was self-improvement. He, he tried to learn Russian and ice sculpting. And, and uh, that's interesting because Andrew Womack wanted us, he wanted to do an ice, they have this up in uh, Cripple Creek, uh, Colorado, they have this ice sculpting contest and stuff. And he wanted somebody to, at, in, at our campus in Woodland Park to do ice sculpting and Said, you know that we could get we could get one of those, you know, chainsaws and we could chop up some ice pretty good. But uh, none of us have has that uh, has that gift. But anyway, and and he he kept and then he learned Russian and then and then uh, I mean back to the movie Groundhog Day. But he learned Russian and then and then he finally had a, some kind of epiphany, kind of some kind of revelation that since he knew what was going to happen in the next day, because he'd already lived that day, and he saw people who were disadvantaged or were going to be hurt or, you know, had accidents or whatever, he could prevent. If he gave himself to help other people, then he could prevent people from being hurt. He could, he could bless their day. And when he did that, he moved into the next day. Guys, what are we here for? What, is, is it really, does my life just revolve around me? What about me? What about me? What about me? What about me? I'm getting dizzy. What about me? 
What about me? It's all about, it's all about moi, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? How can we move into the next day? How many of you want to move into your future? How many of you want to fulfill what God has for you? I, I, I don't want to live my life where a preacher has to lie at my funeral. I preach a lot of funerals, Stan. And <laughs> I was preaching one funeral one time. And, you know, I'm just there ahead. I didn't know this. I knew the fam. I knew some of the family members of the guy that passed away. I didn't know the guy, and so I'm just getting stuff from family members telling me about this guy, and I'm talking about him. And these two guys on the second row are looking at one another, and who's he talking about? That's <laughs> I don't know that guy. He's talking about we're in the wrong funeral. <laughs> anyway. I don't want to live my life like that. I, and I, I don't want to look. When I, I want to live my life in a way that when, when I stand before the Lord, I'm going to hear well done. Not well. Yeah. So God said he has a future for you and me. Is that right? So how do we move into the, how, how can we move into our future? Are, are, are you interested? I just want to. I just want to just help you see that no matter what's happened in 2020, no matter what you've lost, no matter what it's what failures, no matter what's you, you think that's happened, uh, it hasn't changed God's mind about you. In 2021 is can be a, can be the best year of your life if you stop living in a rear view mirror. And I want to, I want to move into my future. How about you? So I, I, I'll just, I just want to, are you interested? Okay. So how, how to move into your future? I'm just going to, four things. There are just four questions. Okay. Number one, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? If you're, if, uh, if what you're seeking, you know, uh, Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. But, but uh, if, you're, if what you're seeking is, is something, you know, focused on yourself or your plans or your idea, and, and, and you know, you come up with your thoughts about what you want to do, and, you know, and, and, and then you, want, you ask God to bless it, that's that that, that you, you're not going to discover your future with your parents' plans or your plans. Uh, I'm talking about of the flesh, uh, but you got to find out what God has for you. And we we read Jeremiah 29:11 that God has a future for us, but then verse 12 and 13 tell you how to move into it. Look at it. It says, "Then you will call upon me, verse 12, and go and pray to me." And I'll listen to you and you will seek me. Everybody say, seek me. You'll seek me and find me when you search for me with, with all of your heart. So what are you, what are you seeking? What are you, what are you seeking? Guys, you can't, you can't move out of Groundhog Day seeking your own way. You can't do God's will your way. You have to stop singing with Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. That's a theme song to hell. Are you listening to me? You got to lay aside your plans, your ideas. You know, I'll, Lord, I'll do anything but. I shared this at the Bible college yesterday. Uh, you know, you got to remove all the buts and all the nevers. If you're going, if you're going to find out what God has for you, you got to say, God, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. See, so in order to begin to seek God. You, you have to lay aside your own plans, your own ideas, your own thoughts about your life and say, God, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I used to be afraid to do that. I thought God would, you know, I mean, I heard pe people getting saved when I was a teenager. I heard the gospel and I was born here in the Quad Cities. My brother still lives in East Moline. 
And, uh, and I went to a Lutheran church and I never heard the gospel one time. Martin Luther would be upset at them today. And I had to move to Houston, Texas to hear the gospel. But then I went to a Baptist church and I heard the gospel. But the only thing, everybody that got saved, they said, I'm submitting to a call to go to Africa. I'm submitting to a call to go to India or China or some God-forsaken place in my mind. <laughs> and, and I wanted, my parents were divorced when I was eight years old and I wanted a family. And I didn't think a pretty girl would follow me to Africa or China or some place like that. So I, I, didn't follow, I didn't accept the Lord because I, I was afraid he would ask me to do something I didn't want to do. And then after I got born again and I, follow, I started following the Lord and I pastored for 27 years, then we transitioned our church and I, over, I oversaw a large African ministry for a period of time before I went with Andrew Womack Ministries because I wanted to. Listen, guys, God's got a wonderful plan for you, but if you're going to discover it, you got to get out of your shoes. When, when Joshua met the captain of the, Lord, of the Lord's host there in, in, a, in Joshua chapter 5, and he said, he, he asked this, he asked, are you for us? And that's not the question, is God for us? God's for us, but are we with him? And, he, and he'd crossed the Jordan, but now how do we take down how do we deal with this insurmountable walls, uh, impenetrable walls of Jericho? And he said, get out of your shoes. Remember, take your shoes off. What does that represent? Your own pre-planned ideas about how you're going to get into your future. You're not going to get victory in your own shoes. You've got to get out of your shoes and depend on the Lord. Start seeking God and and trust God. He's got a better plan for you, my brother and sister, than what you've got for yourself. And I don't care how old you are, how young you are. You can't get into your future in your own shoes. Look at your neighbor on the other side and say, he's talking to you, I know for sure now. (laughs) And look, guys, you haven't begun to seek the Lord until you lay your own plan down. It's like what what happened with Moses. Stephen said in Acts chapter 7, it came into Moses' heart to become a deliverer of the children of Israel when he was 40 years old. But remember, he he tried to deliver the children of Israel by killing one Egyptian at a time. And he had to go get his BSD degree backside of the desert. And then... But then God revisioned him after 40 years and the, at the burning bush. And then and he told him the same thing. I want you to deliver the children of Israel. Now take this rod. And then what did he ask him to do with the rod? Throw it down. What did it become when he threw it down? A snake, which represents selfish ambition, the serpent nature that's in every one of our uh, plans and, and ministry Dreams that, it, that where, we, where we haven't sought the Lord and circumcised our heart from selfish ambition. And it became a, it, it became a snake and tw- he told him to pick it up by the tail which meant certain death to him. And, and it, then he picked it up by the tail and it became the rod of God in his hand. What is he, what is he saying here, guys? If you're going to get into your future, you've got to lay down your dream and pick it up the way God tells you to pick it up. Good preaching, Pastor Greg. Hallelujah. <laughs> so what are, what are you seeking? And number two, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? Look at Genesis chapter 12. I mean 15. Genesis 15. I'm going to read a few verses there. Genesis 15. Verse 1, it says, after these things. Everybody say, after these things. So we're going to come back to that. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your exceeding, exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless in the heir of my house as Eleazar? And then verse 4, in the word of the Lord um, 
uh, and, the, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one, Eleazar, shall not be your heir, but one who shall come from your own body will be your heir. Then he brought him out and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them, and so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he com- uh, counted it to him for righteousness. Okay, so what's going on here? Abram had been promised by God that he was going to be the father of many nations. Remember in Genesis chapter 12? And he, and he, and he told, God told him, leave your family, you know, get out of your country, I'm going to, sh- to a land I'm going to show you. Well, you know, he had, uh, the father of our faith had, uh, incom- first of all, incomplete obedience because he went to Haran about three quarters of the way to Canaan and he stopped and he lived there long enough to get possessions and all kinds of stuff and servants and and then his father died and finally then he went into the land remember okay you can you can find it in Genesis 12 and 13 and and 14 and so then he went into the land and God, and God visited him again to to, to confirm to him he was in the right place and, and then, but then there was famine in the land, and it said he went on still. In Genesis 13, he went into Egypt, and there he laid his wife's neck on the line to save his own. Remember? And, and this is the father of our faith. It gives me hope. <laughs> right? He made some mistakes. He messed up. Then he came back into the land. Then he had relationship conflict with Lot, and Lot chose the best land over his relationship with Abram. And how many of you know that had to have hurt Abraham? And then, and then you know, he had warfare. He had, to, he had to go rescue Lot. And then, you know, he tithed. He, had, he left money on the table that could have been construed as a bribe. And, after, and then, not only that, but it's about somewhere 10 to 15 years from the time that God had promised. Now, and so after these things... After all these things that happened, after, uh, you know, it's not so much, I don't think Abraham was disappointed in God, he was disappointed in himself. And he made mistakes and, and, and he had relationship conflict. Any of you ever had any of that relationship conflict? And, and he had, you know, disappointment and, and, and uh, money that, that it looked like he lost and, and or left behind and you know, all, and, then, and then just the delay of promise. After all of these things, uh, he said, you know, Father, not, you know, you can do, you can do it through Eleazar. And in verse 4, God said, not going to happen, son. It's going to be one through, that's going to come through your loins still. What is he saying? The deal is still on. No matter... <laughs> No matter how disappointed you are at Seven Mountains Church, no matter how disappointed you are in yourself where you made mistakes, your mistakes don't define you unless you let them. No matter how much, you know, you've been disappointed in yourself, no matter how much other people have tried to get in the way, no matter relationship conflict and financial loss and all of that, and then just... How long it's been since God put it in your heart? How many of you have a dream that God put in your heart? Does anybody here have a dream? Okay, and it hasn't come to pass yet. Listen, he said that disappointment, that delay, that's not going to stop my promise from coming to pass. Get, lift up your eyes from all of that stuff that's happened in COVID 2020 and disappointment and delay and relationship conflict and all of that. Lift up your eyes and get your focus on me because the deal is still on. The deal is still on. God will yet bring it to pass. Oh, what are you seeing? You got to, you, you've got to get your focus off of what you, what's happened and even your focus off of your mistakes and get your eyes back on the promise. Amen. Amen. Look at yourself now and say, I know he's talking to me. (laughs) What are you seeking and then what are you seeing, guys? 
Because God said, no matter, no matter what's happened, no matter how long it's been, no matter how long the delay is, he said, I gave that promise to you, and I'm going to bring it to pass. You're not too old. I shared this verse uh, at Karis Bible College yesterday. In Psalm 39, 5 says, your age is as nothing to me. Just read it. <laughs> your age isn't anything, man. If, if, John could, if John was 90 years old on the Isle of Patmos and, and, and he was isolated and, a, and limit, it had limitation and isolation and he's 90 years old and God, Jesus came to visit him in that place and he gave him a new assignment. God's got a, God's got, God's got a future for you. Do you have breath? Are you, are you breathing? What are you seeing? Some of you need to get your focus off of social media. Some of, you, you, some of you need to fast, but you don't just need to fast food. You need to fast social media, and you need to let God rebirth on the inside of you and revision you and show you that he's yet going to bring the dream to pass. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Then what are you saying? Number Three, what are you saying? And I have the airport in sight. All right, we will be landing shortly. But we have not landed yet, so, and I have no parachutes, so just hold on. Mark chapter 11, verse 23. For surely I say to you, whoever, shall, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and doesn't doubt in his heart but believes those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, my brother and sister. You can get hung by your tongue. See, it's not just what you're, if you've got to start by, if you're going to get into your future, you've got to lay aside your plans, get out of your shoes. God, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything. And then when, when you start seeking the Lord, then you start seeing what he has for you. But then you have to come into agreement with that. You have to agree with what, you have to agree and let the words of your mouth agree with what you want to come to pass. Because, because death, uh, Rome, uh, Proverbs 18.21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. But it's what you believe in your heart that you say that really matters. Yes? And, uh, man, I, I've got so many I've got so many examples about this, but whenever we speak what, what we see in the present, what happens is we lock ourselves into, uh, we handcuff ourselves into that scenario. That's why, that's why God told Abraham, look, come on, son, get, get, get it, come on outside. Get your focus off of these circumstances and, what, and, and all these things and look up again. You've got to get your eyes, guys. If you're going to move into your future, you've got to get your eyes off of what you're seeing in the natural. And you've got to get your eyes on what the, Lord is, what the Lord is speaking to you, and then you agree with it. If you don't agree with it, it's not coming to pass. Now, how many of you have a child that is maybe or has been an, or ever been a prodigal? Anybody, anybody ever had one like that? So... So, um, you know, we had a, we had four we have four children. We have twelve grandchildren, and uh, my my oldest son, if Doctor Dobson had a, you know he wrote a lot of books about marriage and parenting and family, and it, he wrote a book called The Strong Willed Child. And if Doctor Dobson had ever met my my oldest son Brian, he would have written three more chapters in his book. And I mean, <laughs> Brian, you would you would draw a line, and he's just going to cross it just to test it. One time he's in the store when he's two and a half or three, and Janet, he's want he gets a case of the I wants he wants something, and you know, and Janice has got his little brother in his in her arms, and so she he's throwing a fit, so she has to swat him, you know, and tell him no, right now we're not going to get that, and he runs through the store. And finds this big old Texan with a big hat, you know, about 
six foot five, and he said, my mom is trying to kill me. <laughs> well, his, his daddy almost did when he got home. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, Brian gave us a run for our money. And when he was turned 15, 16 years old, from the time he was probably 16 till he was 23, he was in a far spiritual country. And the enemy would come to us and tell us, what kind of pastor, we were pastoring. What kind of pastor are you? What kind of parent are you? And how many of you would like to know how to do real spiritual warfare? Real spirit, here's real spiritual warfare right here. The enemy, enemy would come to us and say, you know, Brian's doing this, he's doing that, he's out partying, he's, you know, anything you can imagine. And, and so I, the Bible says, agree with your adversary quickly while he's in the way. I, so I just said, this is real spiritual warfare. I said, yep, that's, hap- that's, that's a fact, that's a fact, that's a fact, that's a fact. And by the way, Mr. Devil, you tempted him. Okay? But while you're here, while you're here, Mr. Devil, let me tell you the way it really is. Isaiah 54, 13 says, my children are taught of the Lord and great is their peace. Uh, Psalm 127 5 says my said my children are going to speak with their enemy in the gate that means you and you're going to rue the day you ever came against my son Proverbs 6 22 says that when my children roam God the word of God leads them when they sleep it keeps them when they're walking it speaks to them I, I and I just started speaking the I'm in first Corinthians 3 verse 5 God sends ministers to every man whereby they might believe. And, I, and you know, I said, my, my, God's sending laborers to my, my son. To, and, and I just, what I did and what you have to do, guys, is you have to agree. You have to agree with what God says no matter what you're seeing and exalt the truth of God's word above the facts. Okay, you don't agree with the facts. Don't exalt the facts above the truth. If you'll exalt the truth above the facts, the truth will win out. And it was a long time, but we kept holding on to the Word of God. And when my son was 23 years old, I was discipling a group of, uh, a group of men in my church, and I told them, I'm going to spend time with you guys, and all I'm going to ask you to do is to go out and find somebody to disciple yourselves. And so this, this guy was uh, 15, years old, 15 years older than Brian. His name was Donald. He later became my children's pastor. He went after Brian. And he started taking him fishing and taking him hunting and feeding him food. And, and in three months' time, three months' time, after eight, seven and a half, eight years, Brian totally turned around, came back to church, started teaching in Sunday school, found his wife. Today, uh, they have three beautiful children. He's a great friend and peer with me. He's a man of God, a, a, a great husband, a great father, leader in the kingdom today. Guys, listen, it's not too late. Your prodigals will come home. If you'll agree with the word of God, what are, listen, what are you saying? Your words will get you stuck like Chuck in a groundhog day of your own making. Or you can agree with what God says and you can get into your future. How long do you have to believe, Pastor Greg? How long do you have to believe? How long do you have to believe? How many have ever heard that? How long have you got to believe? Uh, do, do you have to believe? How many of you are believers? How many of you believers? Do you, okay, how did you get that way? How did you become a believer? You had to believe that God raises dead people, right? Now we've landed and we're about to pull up to the terminal. I'm going to give you one, the last one in a moment, but so don't get nervous. But how many? Of you, how many? Of you, you had to believe God raises dead people. If you believe, if you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved, right? So you believe that God raises dead people, right? Is that right? Okay, do you believe believe that that, that Jesus was raised from the dead? How many of you believe that? How many of you saw the event? Okay, you believe your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life? 
How many of you have ever seen the book? How many believe you're going to heaven when you die? How many have you ever been there? Now let me get let me get this straight, Pastor Josh. This is a weird bunch of folks here. Your very eternal existence is based on an event that happened that you didn't witness, a book that your name's written in that you've never seen, and a place you're going you've never been. Is that right? And you believe that. How long are you going to believe that? <laughs> Say I'm a believer. And you believe that forever. Yes. Now, <laughs> you believe your very eternal existence is, is based on, on you believing that. And you're sweating a little bit of healing that you're believing for you haven't seen yet. A little bit of financial blessing that you're believing for you haven't seen yet. A little relational harmony or prodigal son you're believing for that hasn't come back home yet. Are you, yet you, how long do I believe? You're a believer. What do believers do? Believe. believe. How long do we believe? There's no term limits on your faith. I'm a believer. What do you do with doubts? How many of you ever had a doubt after you believed? Okay, look at it. I doubt you doubt. <laughs> doubts are made to doubt. I'm a believer. I'm going to believe. And let me tell you something. My son came back in the kingdom, and so will yours. Do, do any of you have a prodigal? right now that you're believing for? Okay, why don't you stand? Let me just agree with you. Father, we agree with the Word of God. And we call back, call back into the kingdom. We call out of darkness and into light uh, every prodigal son and daughter. And we declare your Word over them, Father. We declare, Isaiah 54, 13, that their, uh, great is their peace and they're taught of the Lord and great is their peace and Psalm 127.5, Father, that they're going, their sons and daughters are going to speak with their enemy in the gate. And we're going to, we agree with Proverbs 6.22, Father, that your, your word is speaking to them. Your, your word is keeping them when they're sleeping. Your word is leading them. And Father, we're, we're calling laborers to be sent into their path in the name of Jesus. We call them out of darkness, call them into light in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, guys, hold on to the Word of God. And then, wait a minute, wait a minute. Then give yourself to uh, minister and witness to other sons, other, uh, sons and daughters. Yes? yes? Amen? Which is the last point. What, where are you sowing? You can, you can be seated. Where are you sowing? Galatians 6, verse 7. So don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will, he'll reap. What, what are you sowing? What do you want to see happen? See, it's like you want to see your children come to the Lord. Or are you making yourself available to sow into someone else's family? My son told me, he'll tell you, he's, I, we, we, just did a, we just did a whole film thing in our what we call Relationship University. And he was testifying. He said, Dad, I, I, was, in a, I was in a bar and, and this girl come and witness to me. And he said, I, I'd start, he said, I couldn't enjoy sin. Because I'd hear your voice. <laughs> and we're best friends now. It's awesome. It's awesome. Listen, guys. If you want to get into your future, what, what, what are you seeking? Okay. Uh, what are you seeing? What are you saying? You've got to agree with what God says about you, not what is, not what you see. And then where are you sowing? Amen? Praise God. I believe you're coming into a great future, 2021. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Father, I just want to thank you for Seven Mountains Church. I want to thank you for the plan that you have for each one of us individually, but also corporately. Thank you for downloading vision and to the pastors here, the elders and leaders. Thank you for unity, Father, in this church. And thank you for kingdom impact in this entire region. I speak over this church. It's a regional church in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you are born again and you know that? Lift your hand. How, is there anyone here that's not, you're not sure about your relationship with God or you've come to the Lord in the past, but you've, 
you've, uh, you know, you've been away from Father's house like my son was, and you just want to come back to the Lord's house today and, or into your relation, right relationship with God. If that's you, right where you are, I'll pray for you. Just lift your hand. I can see your hand. I see that hand. Anyone else? I see that hand. Thank you for your courage to just, just to open your heart to the Lord. Let's all pray this together. Just say, Heavenly Father, you've got a plan for my life. You've got a great future. And I turn from trying to live that future out in my own way. I submit to you. I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. I'm yours, God. I apply the blood of Jesus to all of my sins, all of my past, and I accept your plan for my life. And I'm, as you accept me, I'm righteous, I'm holy, and, and because I receive your righteousness, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I encourage you, uh, if you lifted your hand there, tell somebody about that. Tell the pastors about that, that, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to live my life with my plans, my dreams, my way anymore. I'm submitting myself to the Lordship of Jesus. I'm telling you, guys, your life's never going to be the same. Since Janice and I yielded ourselves to the Lord uh, in 1976, our, our life's never been the same. We've had wonderful adventure in the kingdom. It's brought us to this wonderful people like you. Amen. God bless you guys.